It's time for another stock review. This time we're talking Polestar, P-S-N-Y. In this video, you're going to see the balance sheet, who's buying on the inside, who's selling on the inside using the most advanced algorithmic software. We're going to look at the stock price, the news, information. We're also going to share with you uh, some breaking news on the stock literally just out a few days ago. We're going to look at the website. We're going to discuss uh, what, I, what I feel about the stock. We're we're also going to uh, look at the, um, I'm going to give you the intrinsic value and whether it's reliable or not. We're going to look at, I'm going to provide you with an, a, a solvency score, a profitability score, giving you the information to make an informed choice whether you should buy this stock, hold it or sell it. It was once upon a time a SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Company. Uh, it's an ADR. What is an ADR? What are ADRs? It's American Depository Receipt. Represents shares of non-US based companies. Banks issue ADRs to facilitate trading on US exchanges. Some banks require investors to pay periodic service fees, typically 0.01 cent to, one, uh, to 3 cents per share. Is that important? Not really. Just let you know that uh, is, is the case though. However, on a stock that's a penny stock, anything under $5, yeah, it's worth noting, but not to be concerned. It's not really a concern at all. It just makes the whole world go round. Anyway, if it's your, fir if it's your very first time here, uh, then please do click subscribe and ring the bell and give us a thumbs up as well when you see this video being uh, come out. It's actually being made during a live show. I do that on purpose. So it's real. It's unedited. I've um, built a studio where I can do it all live as it happens. And that way I can, I can answer questions. If anybody in my show, my members only uh, wish to ask a question or, or highlight a super chat or do anything at all during the live making of this video, it'll appear in this video. So if anybody subscribes to the channel, you'll see it happen or becomes a member or anything else. It'll happen live. These reviews are using the most advanced algorithmic software. We know and uh, every single one of my reviews, now over 34, 35 now, uh, have appeared on the homepage of Alpha Spread, the most advanced algorithmic software in the world, above Bloomberg, above CNBC, Working Lunch, all of those. Uh, they they use all of my reviews. Uh, they they penny uh, they uh, cherry pick others because it's real. It's not based upon sponsorship nonsense. It's based upon facts, numbers, and all the rest of it. So sit back, relax. Let's get straight into Polestar. So without further ado, let's uh, discover what Polestar is. We're going to start very very basic. And then we're going to get into a much more advanced detail. So we're going to start nice and simple. Some of you switch off and go, it's not, it's all, he's using Robin Hood. I'm not going to watch this. Well, you miss the whole point of the video unless you watch it through. All right. Okay. Let's get straight into it. As you can see, uh, it's, uh, well, I think everybody knows, but I'll give it to you anyway. Polestar is an EV company, automotive, holding UK PLC engages in the manufacturer. That's a publicly a public company, by the way, uh, in the in, in the UK. I'm also from the UK, as you know. Distribution sale of electric vehicles. It produces include Polestar 1, a performance hybrid sedan. So it's a hybrid car, not fully electric, Polestar 2, an electric sedan, that's all electric, and Polestar 3, an electric SUV. Show a bit more. Let's have a look. The company was founded in uh, September 1521. It was a SPAC um, and is headquartered in Gothenburg, Sweden. And if you want to know how to pronounce that word correctly, it's actually Hotteberia. And I do, how do I know? Because I have family in Sweden. That's how I know. Uh, in Stockholm. The listed name of PSNY is Polestar Automotive. Okay. Founded in 2021, Hotteberia Vasta Gochland. That's how we pronounce it if you're Swedish. Uh, Thomas uh, Inglath uh, is uh, Swedish, of course. And um, if you do buy this on margin, and I am currently uh, $50,000 in margin, 8%, Bearing in mind, it's 100% maintenance. So what does that mean? If you use margin, it's regarded as high risk. You have to have more available funds to protect your investment by using margin. Just gives you an indication of the, of the volatility of the stock. It's a 5.26 billion market cap, high today, 255. Uh, 52 week low, 659. Uh, price to earnings ratio, negative 376. It's obviously, um, 
It's obviously losing money. Um, but that's typical of a new startup. Of course, Tesla was at the beginning. But you need to compare that. That doesn't mean to say it's cheap or free or whatever else. You need to compare it to other EVs in the sector. And we can give you a full list of competitors. And you can check their price earnings ratios later in this video. No dividend. It's a growth stock. Has it hit, has it, it hit its S curve? Well, we'll discuss that later in the video as well. Low today, 247. 52 week low, 198. So it's near all time lows. Okay near. Volume. Average volume is 2.47 million. And the volume today so far at uh, two minutes past 10 central time is 65,000. Uh, so we are below average volume today. Now, a low volume stock means you might not be able to get out of it when you want to get out of it because no one's buying the stock at the price you want to sell it. You might have to reduce your price to get it sold. So a stock with low volume means you might not always be able to sell it for the price that you want. Just worth noting. Uh, now, these are the analysts. I'm going to analyze the stock in a minute in an, un, in an unbiased way, unsponsored, not paid, looking at numbers. However, a lot of analysts are paid. Well, they're all paid. Uh, depends who pays them, depending on what, what review you get. Um, but uh, this one is a hold. 33% uh, say buyer. This is provided by Morningstar. I don't like their reviews. I don't think they're that accurate. However, it's what we have here. We're just basically touching the surface at the moment. As you can see, the earnings is all over the place. At one point, we thought they were going to make money, uh, 0.14 cents up, and then straight back down again. We'll find out why in a minute. Why did they grow and then back down and then they're growing again? And uh, and it looks uh, very, very much of a gamble where the analysts really know what they're going to do. An analyst expectation is in this color here. And this this is what they actually did. Analysts are rubbish. Wall Street is rubbish at analyzing stocks. They always have been. They always will be. They are not investors. They are traders. Here today, gone tomorrow. Short markets. God knows what else. They're not looking at what they don't understand. They just don't care, basically. They look at where we are today and they dump the stock or they buy the stock or whatever. In and out in seconds, uh, doing millions of trades on algo, uh, algo systems. Anyway, the, this is the expect. This is the uh, the earnings for Polestar. It's very up and down. Doesn't tell us a lot. Let's see who we are in bed with. Now, this is important because this will tell us the flavor of the stock, how it trades. And the worst thing is Mullen. You don't want to see Mullen on the list. Uh, might be. It's an EV stock. But you've got Lucid, which is just as bad. Not quite just as bad. Mullen, sorry, Lucid probably produced the best EV in the world. However, they've got the worst CEO in the world. He takes all the money out, pays himself half a billion dollars. False information left, right and centre. It's going private. It's going bankrupt. I'm not in it. It's a load of rubbish. Um, and uh, because of that, the uh, this is the sort of volatility that Polestar will attract because people that are in Polestar, Lucid, are in Polestar. Unfortunately, that's a fact. Rivian, uh, obviously, we've got some more EVs here. Um, and uh, again, Rivian loses money, but not anywhere near as much as Lucid does. Lucid's the worst. Rivian is better, much, much better management, much better funded. Uh, mind you, the Rivian CEO pays himself a good number. I don't think it's as much as uh, Peter Rawlinson at Lucid, but never mind. Uh, anyway, Fisker, I did a review on that recently. You can go and check that out. But there is a big warning sign. Mullen, the worst stock on the stock market. Um, Dave Mitchery, no many, many times for taking companies down the toilet. Does it for a past time. I followed them all. I've studied them all. Um, false information flying around. Sponsored, um, sponsored um, uh, uh, people going around YouTube channels trying to get people to promote rubbish. We had it on our show for a while. They tried to manipulate us. I soon got rid of it uh, when they started offering me all sorts of money. I said, bugger off. I'm not here, I'm not here for that. Um, so anyway, Mullen is uh, one of those. So this stock and canoe, we, we, we all penny stocks it. No Tesla. No Tesla here. These are the main stocks, main shareholders that own Polestar. So it's a worry. Uh, it's a worry because it means the stock, even, no matter how good it might be, will trade with extreme volatility. However, that presents itself an opportunity if we do have a good balance sheet and a good management. Uh, one of the things I like to do is research the, the, the CEO and get to know who the person is and all the rest of it. 
So anyway, let's have a look at it. Uh, we don't invest in products. We invest in c companies. Companies are the people that work there. Uh, the car might look great. Lucid's a great car, but Peter Rawlinson's a flipping idiot. Um, so at the end of the day, he hasn't achieved anything. He just takes all the money for himself. Um, so the car looks great. This is their website, but I don't quite honestly care what the car looks like, really, to be perfectly honest. Um, it's very nice, but unless you can make a business and uh, why would I want to invest in it? That's the thing. This is the, the car. Looks very cool. Again, I'm not going to really get that excited about it. Uh, I want to look at the numbers, the business, the CEO, the history, what they're doing. The website's very, very nice, which is good. Um, it's a very well laid out website, uh, unlike Mullen, which is a total joke. Um, this shows you the interior. I got to say, I'll give uh, a seven out of 10 for the website. Very, very slick website, actually. Um, let's see how the company speak to its um, investors. Is there anything on here? I'm doing this live. Um, let me see. Uh, careers, design, media, investor relations. Here we go. I want to see how the company addressed the investor. We looked at PDD the other day, a Chinese company. Basically, they advertise on their website that they don't care about the investor. Their website was done by a five-year-old and uh, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. However, um, Polestar liked to address its um, investors. Very Apple-esque, actually. Very nice website. Very clean. Um, latest press releases, 15th of November, Polestar 4 production starts, first customer deliveries expected before um, the end of 2023. Okay, so they're about to deliver. That could be good for the stock. We'll cover that, that in more detail in a minute. Now, of course, this is, for, this is a Swedish company. Um, and I will tell you now that Sweden are, are a very wealthy country. I know I've got family there and, um, they are the home of Volvo and Saab luxury car products, lots of money. So, um, and a country that is very much into the environment. So uh, natively this could do well. Most certainly Norway is all Teslas. Teslas are everywhere. Um, maybe it'll go Polestar because Norway is part of Scandinavia. All four countries are like, like the British Isles, like United Kingdom. Anyway, very easy to drive around from one to another. So you could get cars made in Sweden, go to Norway, Denmark, Finland. Very, very easy. Very, very small countries, however, though. Right. Um, that's that. Let's look at some latest news. Uh, this is their concept car. Um, Let's have a look at this. Um, we'd wager that most Americans haven't heard of Polestar, a relatively new manufacturer of all electric luxury vehicles, and the automaker is intent on changing that. Polestar Day is a small part of those plans. Now, I would invite, I would like to invite uh, the CEO and other members of Polestar to reach out to me via my DMs on Instagram, X, and so on and so forth, as I do do Meet the CEO series. Would love to hear from you, share your story about your company. All uh, CEOs are now invited onto my show, and I'd like to have you on my show and discuss your products, and your business, and your brand. Okay. Let's have a look at this. Held at Barker Hangar in Santa Monica, California, this one make auto show uh, was a massive display of everything the brand has to offer in the upcoming years. In addition to giving us an opportunity to ride in the new Polestar 3, mid-size electric SUV, and the avant-garde Polestar 4 uh, fastback SUV coupe. We also got a chance to learn more about the automaker's upcoming products and partnership with suppliers. Some announcements seemed more feasible than others, but it's clear that the automaker has ambitious uh, ambitions beyond simply selling cars. That's important. Very important. We are looking for proprietary, unique ownership as an owner of a company, not as a share, uh, 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 someone who just buys stocks. I want to own companies. Uh, some announcements seem more feasible than others. Read on for everything that was revealed to us during Polestar Day. I'm not going to go into all of this. I can post all the links for this in a minute on my uh, on my review. But uh, we will have a look in a minute. Uh, your Polestar could help 
power a struggling grid. Now, of course, uh, we know that uh, Tesla does that, Cybertruck does that, even the Lightning does it, just not very effectively. But uh, the light, the uh, Tesla Cybertruck, you can power your house. So basically, if you buy a Cybertruck, and I'm guessing this, then you can reverse the power and uh, you can basically uh, eliminate a ten twenty thousand dollar investment in a uh, in, in a diesel generator. Your Cybertruck can power your house. Well, many of Polestar's ambitions are pragmatic. The revelation st uh, struck as being a bit more of a moonshot. Increased reliance on electricity has placed greater strain on power grids, and Polestar think it's developed a solution. The automaker announced his plan to use the Polestar 3 bidirectional charging technology. This is not new. Tesla invented it to serve as a virtual power plant as it begins to a pilot program in its hometown, Rotterberia, Sweden, Gothenburg in English. Polestar's vehicle to grid project envisions dormant EVs as a battery storage for struggling power grids while a Polestar 3 is configured in the virtual power plant set setting. It would pump electricity into the home or the surrounding grid to minimize the inconvenience to owners lending their vehicles towards this idealistic effort. Polestar plans on using mobile application to schedule sh charging times to prep the three for driving when it is needed. So as I understand it, what they're saying is because we need more electricity, the unused cars could then put their power back into the grid. But of course, then they've got to charge it back up again. I don't know if that's a full solution or anything. It's, it's a backup for your house if you lost power. But if we're using cars to put into the grid, they're not self-charging. They have to then take it back out of the grid I'd need that explained to me how that would benefit anything. Um, we've been able to do that on Tesla for a while now. There's nothing new there. I'd like to know how they think that's going to help the grid, though, because you're taking it to give it back, then you've got to take it back again. Don't know. Anyway, let's get into the numbers. Uh, that's an interesting concept, the way they've put the, the way they've done that. But anyway, let's look at the numbers and uh, let's start. Are you ready? OK, let's get into the meat and bones of the video. Uh, now, if you are watching this live, you can click subscribe or ring the bell or watching it, of course, on the video. Tap the like button uh, during the live stream or uh, tap it as you're watching it. If you want to do a live comment, you can. We're now going to get into the meat and bones of of, of it. They only charge during off hours, says David Burroughs. Uh, there we go. I'm just going to add that to the video. David Burroughs has just brought this in. So what he's saying is they only charge during off hours. Okay, so we're sort of building a schedule. Now, again, again, any, any car can do that. You could put a timer. If you plugged in your Tesla and said, you know, uh, remember, it's all over the air. All over air um, updates on a Tesla. So say, for example, you've got a Tesla plugged in and there was some benefit to the environment and Elon Musk sent out an update and it said, even though the wall, the wall charger doesn't have any technology, perhaps it's just power, your car could say, I'm not accepting any charge until midnight. That's what an iPhone does now. An iPhone does the same thing. It protects the battery, looks at a time when other people aren't charging. It's smart charging, in other words. We're sharing the load. We're looking at, uh, you know, you know, there's a, there's a power drain right now, whereas if everyone charged up right now, we would have to go to external power sources, whereas if we, if we hold back these cars from charging, we can stay for the on green power rather than turning up the gas turbines or whatever it might be. That's great. That can be achieved with technology in an over-the-air update. So any over-the-air app updatable car could potentially do that. Um, so they're, they're selling it as, a, um, as some kind of incentive or attraction to the business, where I suggest any over-the-air updatable car could do that 
Um, certainly a Tesla can do that now. Anyway, but thank you very much, David Burrows. It's to reduce peak hours use. It makes sense. Not effective for emergency use. No, not effective. But of course, all of this is uh, flexible. All of this over-the-air updatable information is flexible, right? If you wanted to turn that off, I'm sure you could. You could charge your house if you had a power outage or whatever it might be. So, David, thank you for contributing during the making of this video. Let's look at the intrinsic value. Now then, best case scenario, the stock is undervalued 43%. Before I go any further, before anyone jumps and goes, well, I'm buying Polestar, it's cheap, I'm loving it, I'm buying it. Let's be absolutely clear what this means. Unlike Morningstar or other reviewers, other analysts, they're paid to do it. They use a whole host of information that I have. However, they have, they are sponsored or paid to produce it. Um, I am going just on the numbers and the facts, and I don't care whether you buy it or don't. I'm not sponsored by anyone. I'm just here to provide the most honest, real information. Um, uh, best case scenario, and we're not right now, it's undervalued 43%. Base case, which is probably kind of where we are heading into a best case. We've got supply issues now rectified. We've got inflation coming down. People will be buying cars in the new year. No doubt about it. Uh, we've got the uh, we've got uh, you know, the Fed reducing rates probably from February. Very bullish on the markets. Very very nice indeed. I am prepared to pay overvaluation twenty five percent for a high growth potential stock. Yes, I am. If it's got a high value, if it's got a high. Um, uh, assets to liabilities ratio, a good balance sheet, low debt, blah, blah, blah. If it's a good business, then I'll do that. Um, and the reason is a high growth stock like this, anything to do with solar, EVs, AI, it can be overbought. So the overvaluation can be 25%. But I'm, I'm okay with that, like Tesla, because people will buy a future price. But right now, though, this is overvalued by 4%, which is good for a high growth potential. As long as it's not a valuation trap, we'll find out in a second, and as long as it has a good balance sheet. Otherwise, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. Worst case scenario, overvaluation, of 100%. We're not in a worst case scenario. Uh, that's where the stock is negative $1.60. That's not relevant at all. Okay, let's go back to the base case for a moment. Let's look. Do we have any warnings uh, about? Uh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. So this is why I said put the brakes on. Persistent overvaluation. Persistent overvaluation detected. What does that mean? Persistently overvaluing the stock. Historical valuation indicates this stock price has continuously exceeded its intrinsic value. Historical valuation indicates this stock price has continuously exceeded its intrinsic value. This enduring overvaluation may be indicative of market over confidence of non-fundamental influences. Again, like I just said, um, you can have a stock that people believe is going to be great in the future, overbuy it or oversell it. And this is just giving you a warning based upon the numbers, which we're about to look at in the, in the, in the balance sheet. You can get easily carried away in thinking this is a better deal than it actually is. So let's go into it. Um, we've got some new software we use here. This was taken, um, from the, the, the Q3 23 earnings. This is using advanced AI, which will then pick up what was said during the earnings and turn it into some useful information that we can use unbiased, unedited as they said it. Okay. Polestar delivered 13,976 cars in Q3. A 51% increase from the previous year, boosting revenue to 613 million. Good. A 41% rise aided by rising volumes and increased prices. However, 
Gross margin stayed low at 1%. It's not a Tesla. It can run out of money. We'll come on to that in a minute. Impacted by a 28 million inventory charge due to weak US demand, high duties and an influx of secondhand cars. You can't sell cars right now. I've got friends who own car lots. They can't sell them. Cars everywhere. Operating losses widened to 261 million from 196 million. Losses are increasing. They could run out of money even if they're the greatest company in the world before they get to profitability. To align with slowing EV adoption and drive efficiency, Polestar adjusted its full-year delivery forecast to 60,000 units and anticipates... Um, and in anticipates, I've lost my place there for a moment, uh, a 2% gross margin. This is not good at all. Looking ahead, initiatives are set to reach break even by 2025 with target deliveries of 155,000 to 165,000 gross uh, margin, uh, uh, gross margins in the high teens. Polestar's approach includes pr uh, product mix improvements, market focused trail strategies, local manufacturing to reduce tariffs and operational cost cuts, including 300 global layoffs. Polestar requires about 1.3 billion in external funding dilution. Um, uh, 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 to meet its financial targets for 2025 with major shareholders, Volvo, remember I talked about Volvo before, uh, and Geely increasing their support. Okay, let's move on. As we talk about it, and very often what happens in my uh, reviews, if I say it's going down, uh, let's have a look at it. Uh, the stock price is down 4%. Let's just look at the markets today. It's important because if the markets are doing well, if my portfolio is doing well, we have to argue why is Polestar going down. Let's have a look. My overall portfolio today, as always, solid. I outperform the S&P. I outperform Warren Buffett. Um, uh, uh, consistently. Very important. Now, if Polestar is going down, are we seeing Tesla go down today? Let's have a look. Is the market selling off today? No, Tesla is up today. What about Rivian? Uh, is Rivian up today? Rivian is up today. So there we go. Uh, doing this review today, talking about Polestar, we are going down. Let me bring up Polestar again. Uh, that has a lot to do with this extra funding required, which means more dilution. We're going to look at the balance sheet in a second and see if this tr company is in trouble. And I'm looking at it already going, ouch. Are you ready? There's the balance sheet. Revenue, first of all. 2.7 billion. It's up 4%. Okay. June, June 30th. Um, up slightly, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7. Up 4%. That's good. Operating income. Down 2%, negative 2%. It's already losing money. It's now uh, losing even more. March 31st, 855. Now it's 874. It's got operating income is going down. Net income. We've just heard why. They explained why. Net income down 38%. Now, is that because they're investing and spending or they just can't sell the cars and they've got a devalue? They've got to raise money and blah, blah, blah. All the rest of it. Free cash flow is up 7% on the most recent range compared to the previous range, all right? But still losing money. Uh, cash flow expenditure, uh, it looks like capital, sorry, capital expenditure, they are spending less. Things look like they're improving on, on that front. Operating cash flow up 5%, which is still negative, all right? This is what worries me. I am a value investor. I look for great companies to own, with good balance sheets that are going to return me as an investor a good profit. I don't like buying companies that are in huge amounts of debt because they have to raise more money, the share price gets devalued, and eventually they can go bust. 4.3 billion in assets. Okay, that doesn't matter. But there's more liabilities and assets. Now then, I don't like that at all. 
no more than 80% liabilities. We're over more liabilities and assets. That is very, very dangerous for Polestar and why it's going down so quickly today. If the majority of that expenditure is not uh, expenses to get something sold and bring money in, it's debt. It's already, in other words, spent the money. It's already done whatever it has to do. It's debt. The company are in all kinds of bother. Let's have a look. Long-term debt, 75 million. Few. <laughs> We're okay. 75 million. So, uh, there's um, out of the out of the 4.7 billion uh, current liabilities, accounts payable 97 million, uh, accrued uh, accrued um, uh, accrued liabilities 148 million, short term debt 1.6 billion, other current liabilities 2.2. I'd not I'd like to know what that is, but long term debt is 75, short term debt. 1.6 billion. So let's look at their uh, their lo their long term debt. It's a small it's a small piece of the pie. Short term debt, however, is increasing 34 percent. We can see. Will short term debt turn into long term debt? I don't know how long they've had it. I'd need to do more research on that. But um, uh, one point, uh, sorry, uh, uh, beg your pardon, where are we? Short-term debt is 1.6 billion. Um, that's not insignificant, not too bad, but uh, the balance sheet doesn't look too bad because it's not long-term. Long-term debt, if they'd had long-term debt, a majority of that 4.7 billion, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole, but uh, short-term debt. What worries me though, is they've got no margins. They could be crushed by the competition. They're at three percent margin. It was five. It went to six. It's now gone backwards. It's three percent. Is it a well managed company? Can it survive? Remember, this was a SPAC, special purpose acquisition. Traditionally, those companies have failed. Virgin Galactic was a SPAC, by the way. Just be just you know to put that into context. The operating income, negative 33%. Net margin, down 10%. PCF margins, negative 69%. Um, let's look at our fundamental scores. Profitability, because we do have profit, even though it's low, can be crushed, is 42%. 42 out of 100. Exceptional three-year uh, return on equity, Exceptional revenue growth forecast, exceptional return on equity um, and positive gross profit, 42. Um, because we don't have that long-term debt, we have short-term debt, 32% solvency. It would be a lot worse. It would be probably in the teens if that was long-term debt and we'd be looking at very risky business. Low DE, positive net debt is negative. Long-term solvency is negative. Short-term solvency is negative. If that was long-term debt, this would be even worse. It's not that bad. It's not red. It's amber. New business setting up. They can have a lot of debt and so on and so forth. So it's not too bad. Um, you need to look though, before you think the balance sheet isn't too bad, it's not going to go bust. That's what basically we're saying. 32%. It's not going to go bust. However, the shareholder is going to get diluted a bit more. They they need to raise more funds. The stock's down. Um, at two thirty eight, though, is it undervalued? Well, it, it, the intrinsic value would suggest it's perhaps potentially maybe overvalued four percent. We can allow a twenty five percent overvaluation on high growth stocks. Uh. This is a difficult one. Um, anyway, let's carry on going. Let's see how much short interest there is. See who's buying on the inside. Wall Street, who are rubbish at, 
evaluate, evaluate, evaluating these sort of companies. They're saying over the next 12 months, we could see a rise of to 945, 290%. Very good indeed. Uh, and the average, we're looking at a th- uh, three, uh, 63%. However, worst case scenario, if it, de- if it has to dilute, which it kind of does, it's a 33%. You're better off buying the S&P with a gar- pretty much guaranteed 10, 15%. Um, that's a worry that, that, that that's going to come in. Um, anyway, let's go and have a look. Competitive forecast. Um, let's go and look at uh, Tesla, for example. Let's open up this window here and see their, uh, their, their averages. Sorry, not their averages. I beg your pardon. Their um, margins. And we can see Tesla have a 20% margin. And they've reduced that and they didn't need to. Um, but they did. They didn't need to do that. But, they, you know. Um, so 20% and we've got and we've got 3% margin on Polestar. That's very close to uh, zero, right? Let's have a look at the... Um, I like how it puts the competition... Have you noticed this? The competition is Tesla, Toyota. We've got Ferrari here as well. It's a luxury car brand, no doubt about it. I'm surprised I mean, Toyota's in there, but obviously it's, an e, it's, an e, it's a car manufacturer. But anyway, let's look at who's buying on the inside. Let's also look at uh, the, 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 uh, the short interest. We've got 13.4% on a short interest of Polestar. So what does that mean? It's not excessive. We're not going to get a short squeeze anytime soon. 20% is excessive, but that doesn't mean it's at 20%. It suddenly explodes. We're at Virgin Galactic at 21. We're starting to squeeze now. Um, but GameStop was 100% when it, when, when it went berserk. So we're not there. What it does mean then is it's going to have a lot of short pressure. The stock is going to be brought down. Uh, and if we've got a dilution around the corner, this stock could be sub $2. So, you know, difficult one. This is uh, the CEO, Thomas Inglath. uh, um, uh, Inglath. I'd like to invite you on the show, sir, uh, if you'd like to. One month ago, let's have a quick listen what he said here. My reviews will be down here within 48 hours. Let's have a quick look. What does he have to Play. say? Uh, it's, 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 I think, a very positive, good one. We have um, two major parts here. One, of course, the great news about the product rollout and the other part about what work we have done over the last summer about uh, the business plan. Obviously, um, making that a strong, resilient business plan, which means clear view on the break even cash flow break even 2025 so what i would call in a very short distance very um, much in sight 2025 um, cash flow break even and the funding need that is needed from today till this break even a very clear defined uh, amount of 1.3 billion which you know we want to cover with a mix of debt and equity so what i would call a very manageable uh, funding need. These two are the key cornerstones of this business plan, which I think everybody would acknowledge is not based on dreamy, fancy um, production numbers, uh, but but really uh, a very realistic and achievable volume. Thomas, let me jump in and ask you about those production numbers because you've scaled back your 2023 um, production forecast a couple of times already. Now you expect to make 60,000 vehicles in total this year, but you need to get up to, I think, 155,000 um, by 2025. How are you going to make it make that leap from 60 to 155 in the next couple of years? Good question. Well, yesterday people were queuing to get a ride along in our Polestar 3 SUV and in the SUV Coupe, the Polestar 4. Both cars are ready to go out. The Polestar 4 actually has production start next week. The Polestar 3 will start production early 2024. So 2024, we will get these two cars in our hands. 25 will be a year where they will be fully in, 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 in customer delivery plus the Polestar 5 joining. So 
three great cars um, in the exclusive. Yep. That doesn't answer the question, though. Uh, he's not given a precise answer how they're going to achieve it, though. If they have to raise cash, he said through equity and debt. So they said there's going to be dilution, but he also said um, through debt. Their short-term, their long-term debt is manageable. He's right there. This could be a potential buy for me, um, but uh, let's have a little bit more of a listen. He needs to give a, 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 he needs to give a direction here. Segment. So these two, so he's, this, this product lineup, of course, is a big, big uh, reason for our um, increase of volume in this period. Thomas, you, you just called your, your products exclusive. What we've seen today is Richemont, the owner of Cartier, warning that they are seeing a significant consumer slowdown at the upper end. You've got Diageo warning that its premium products are starting to hit price resistance. We're seeing it all across the luxury sector at the moment that the consumer is saying, I can't afford that anymore, even the upper end consumer. Are you seeing any evidence of that? Uh, Let's address this because this is exactly why we are out of the SNP. We are out of Amazon. We are out of Apple. Apple are getting resistance. Why we are in companies that are oversold, uh, uh, un we're undervalued, and we are in Coca-Cola and J&J. We've got defensive stocks because remember, the economy is behind the markets. The markets next year is uh, now going to feel the pain. And that's why interest rates are going to start coming down. So as an investor, you're looking for the next five moves, like a chess, like a chess player. Um, even though the consumer, the person that buys stuff, is feeling the pain, the investment should now be coming in because that's the point when things start to come down and that's when things can start to grow. But uh, the, 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 the pain that the Fed have put on people the person, the customer, is now being felt and will increase, not decrease, next year. But we still believe a soft landing, don't believe in recession. However, uh, it will, it will, it will uh, improve very, very quickly. That's why as an investor, I'm trying to find value stocks, stocks that are so well down that when we can get into the, into the uh, rates coming down, things can go up very quickly. Exclusive EV products going to face the same headwinds that the rest of the luxury sector might be seeing at the moment? I think it's very important to put that in perspective. I think there's no doubt that the long-term success of electrification uh, is given. The only way of CO2 emission reduction is via EVs. Um, transition from combustion engine to EVs is... Um, is a clear path forward. Short term, economic fluctuations. The industry has seen that over decades. I think the real question is how resilient are you as a business to go through those? Correct. And I think us having presented this business plan is a clear testimony of Polestar being on the side of the winners to go through those downsides and just simply um, be resilient enough to to get out as a winner in that. So for that reason, um, I don't think there's any, um, any question about the EV success in the long term. Thomas, you've just um, uh, talked to us about your new business plan that you presented and said you need $1.3 billion. You're very specific about what you need uh, to be cash flow uh, break even in 2025. Um, you need that externally, that funding, are you in talks with any external investors? What kind of outside investors um, do you want to do you want to hook up with? And, and has anyone expressed interest? Well, look, hmm. we were always very um, clear about the openness to attract outside um, investors. Um, our two main shareholders who have been and will be very supportive in um, in our business, of course. Um, will stay with us, but they are very willing for, to have others participating in the ownership of uh, Polestar. And that's how we, how we plan ahead. So Volvo and Geely, do you think the other investors, could they come from China? Are you in talks with Chinese, other Chinese investors? No, we are worldwide um, pitching for this. So there's certainly no preference in any regional um, um, 
um, destination where these people should come from. Now, we are here, obviously, um, today um, in the US. We have US production with supposed to three starting. Um, I think that this is well a very clear sign that we are an international business yep. open to international investment. Thomas. What I want to know is, are they going to go to the shareholder or can they raise the cash without? Because if they have to go to the shareholder, the price is going down again. You flag the fact that you have US production. President Biden has, within the last couple of days, signaled his support for the UAW to start targeting businesses like Tesla. He thinks that maybe that's the next, next place that they should be looking. What do you think about your labor? Do you think you could be facing strikes? Do you think you could be facing a union push? Do you think this is going to be something that pulls in the whole of the automotive sector in the United States? Well, not really that much um, the question to us because we have a very um, simple way of having basically no manufacturing footprint on our own. We have contact manufacturing with our uh, big partners in, in that, obviously, the Volvo factory in Richville. We have um, production together with Geely. And this is where, uh, of course, this question you have now uh, should be targeted. We are very well familiar with, um, with, with factories, with unions. We have, obviously, in Sweden, um, a, a very strong base as well with manufacturing in, in, in Volvo. So I think that's uh, really no question mark from our side onto that. What is the Polestar, you know, the unique selling point? Because, you know, some brands, Porsche is about, you know, uh, speed and sports cars. Mercedes is about kind of luxury and status. Volvo is about, you know, safety and, and family, at least for me. What, what is Polestar <laughs> yeah. about? Plus, our main differentiator clearly is our design focus. It's it's a brand with um, strongest design, design as advanced as its technology. That's our slogan. And I think yesterday at our poster day, when you see the lineup of the beautiful cars and how innovation is brought to. We'll compare the numbers in a moment before we do a final analysis review uh, uh, conclusion on, on Lucid. Uh, I'd like to look at that. The customer, through our design, made it really desirable. I mean, that is how we think electrification will succeed. Cars that really make people are passionate about. And what is the greatest driver for passion um, is clearly the, the design aspect of it. So if you ask us to narrow it down to that one aspect, it's design. Thomas, great to catch you up. Really appreciate you joining us from Los Angeles. Thomas Ingolath. Of there we go. That was interesting. Uh, let's, uh, let's just continue just a moment. And let's just have a look. Using the, our software, we know that... Um, let's have a quick look. Let's compare it. I think this, I think this, this would be uh, important. Um, if we look at the, the financials then with Polestar, um, we can see the liabilities are outstripping the assets. We can see their 3% margin. Let's just look at Lucid. I Because it, it's all about the best car. That's what they're describing. Um, the trouble is Lucid is broken because of Peter Rawlinson. Um, they are, they are. if we look at Lucid, um, best base case, worst case. So ba there's, there's undervaluation. So they're saying that uh, the, uh, Lucid, uh, our software is saying Lucid's a better buy. Um, better balance sheet, 8.9 billion, 3.5 liabilities. Uh, Long-term debt, 2.2 2 billion out of the three. Okay. Um, what about the margins? The, the margins, gross margin. Yeah, we know. They're, they're <laughs> This is because of Peter Rawlinson, basically. It's like, we sell every car just to pay me. I don't know how he gets away. I don't know how he walks into the work every morning. So I just wanted to compare that to the efficiency of Lucid. Yeah, there's no efficiency at Lucid. It's just run for Peter Rawlinson's benefit. Um, a bit like uh, Mullen. It's a shame because Mullen's a scam and uh, and um, and uh, Lucid have for a good car, but they have a terrible CEO. Um, so anyway, going back to Polestar, we'll wrap up our review. Um, let me bring it back up here again. 
Um, I think we covered everything. Now let's look at the uh, the inside trading. We covered the review. We've covered the news. Um, let's look at the last 90 days. Uh, it was positive news, 56% positive. Uh, we then went uh, 30 days. Uh, it's increased last seven days. Now we're getting some negativity, and today there's no news at all today. Let's look at, do we see any inside trading? Anyone buying on the inside? Let's have a look. Um, no, no share, shareholder action. So no one buying or selling. That's interesting. Nothing here. Very, very, in, that's interesting. I've not seen that before. Um, nothing at all. Nothing over the last period. No, no shareholder um, information. Nope. No shareholder action at all. Okay. Um, nope. I'm just trying to see if it was anywhere else. No, it's not. Okay, let's, let's wrap this review up then. Um, my view is EV most certainly is the future. For me... You're better off buying Tesla because of the margin, the balance sheet, the numbers, the penetration, the fact that with Tesla, you own solar, dojo, self-drive, licensing, uh, so much more than just a car. Um Polestar worries me because it has to raise funds. Its long-term debt wasn't a major problem. Um, I don't know. If you were going, really, you can only compare it to, to Lucid, if I'm honest. You can only really compare it to Lucid and it's far, it's far better the margins are better, and I'm guessing just because the CEO doesn't pay himself half a billion dollars a year. I'd like to find that out. I'd like to invite him on the show and ask him, how much do you pay compared to Peter Rawlinson? Um, I think Polestar is a better buy than Lucid. Um, potentially has better growth. It's interesting. I'm going to put it on my watch list. It might be worth, it might be worth me buying some shares here and watching it. So I'm going to, I'm going to put it on my watch list. I'm not going to say it's a buy or sell, but I'm going to put it on my watch list. All right. So that's my review. If you've watched this, please do subscribe and ring the bell. Um, if you'd like the link to my, um, software that I use alpha spread, it's the most advanced algorithmic software available. Um, uh, I have a link to it and I will give it above my head or down in the description. Uh, you'll find uh, all the reviews over here and meet the CEOs, uh, the whole playlist here where I speak to the CEOs. I will invite um, Polestar to, uh, to to join me and respond to this video. So there we go. I was just, just got a new member. Going to has become a member. Just got a new member during the live show. Thank you very much indeed. So if you are a member, I'll do a full review for you. My full uh, playlist of all my reviews will be down here, above my head and below were all the links. It's on my watch list. It's not a buy for me right now. I'm concerned about the raising funds. I'm concerned about um, next year. I, I am not buying anything at the moment. Everything else in my portfolio is up. I'm beating the market consistently, beating Warren Buffett consistently. As you can see, my market's looking, my portfolio is looking great. Uh, constantly beating the market and all the rest of it. Other stocks are going up, uh, but um, stocks that are that are overpriced, that have financial, financial difficulty are going down. I'm looking for value. So for me, it's not a buy right now, um, but I'm going to keep it on my watch list and get more information. Hopefully I can have the CEO on my show and we can add to this. Until next time, as always, take care of yourselves and each other.